Tonight we are learning Le'ilu Nishmas Rav Zechariah Shemen Ben Rav Yitzchak HaKoyen. So the idea of Torah and Shavuos is a very, very important, um, obviously it's, it's the essence of Shavuos is the accepting of the Torah, but there's something more than that that I really want to go and to focus on and that is how when you look at people that, that are not so from, and then they become frommer, and they become more religious, and they become closer to the Torah, closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you realize that they become better people, like they become a nicer people. Let me rephrase that. They're supposed to become better people. They're supposed to become nicer people, slower to anger. And I've had, you know, people that I have spoken to, spouses, where they've told me that when their spouse became more religious, all of a sudden they became a better spouse. They became happier, they became less angry, they became they became like better in the relationship. And they were all, and because of that, they, they actually started becoming more religious. And in some points, they actually became more religious than their spouse because they saw the effect that it had. But on the flip side, sometimes you have people that are sitting and they're religious. And it's just the better part, the changing of you becoming a better person doesn't always come to fruition. And the question is, is, is what, what are we missing over here and what we can, can we do that we can tap into that change? Because really Torah is supposed to make you a better person. Spo Torah is supposed to change you. So we know that before that, the Yidin, the Jewish people, got the Torah on Har Sinai. HaKadosh Baruch Hu went and he offered the Torah to the other nations. Very famous Medrash, we all know this. He went to the people of Edom, he went to the, to the, to the descendants, the ancestors of uh, Esau. Really, it's the angels. He went to the, to, the, um, to the archangels of Esau and said, do you want to accept the Torah? So the angel of Esau says, so what's written in the Torah? It says, so the you know, Baruch Hu answered, it says that you're not supposed to uh, murder. And the angel, you know, Esau replies and says, wait a minute, the, you know, the bracha that Yitzhak gave us is al char we're going to live on our sword. That's literally our, our, the, the, the way that we survive is on the sword. The way that killing is in our blood, literally, we have to go and spill blood. That's what's in our blood. We, I, we can't do that. And they were like, no, thank you. So they went, to, uh, this bracha went to Amun Amayev. And Amun Amayev says, so what's written in the Torah? You want to give it to us? What's written inside? And then Akadosh Baruch Hu goes and says, you should not commit adultery. And they're like, adultery? I'm like, this is, you know, this is how we started. You know, Amun Amayev, how did they start from Light and his daughters? It came from, from a, this incestuous uh, relationship. So they're like, we're out. And they went, Akadosh Baruch Hu went to Ishmael. And, and Ishmael asked, so what is it written inside over there? And Akadosh Baruch Hu says, it's written that you should not steal. They're like, still, like, this is how we make a living. This is where our, our bread and butter is literally taking other people's bread and butter. This is how we deal. We can't, like, no thank you. And the Medrash goes on and goes on to explain that Akadish Baruch went to all the nations and all the nations went and refused. And we have to ask a question, like, why did Akadish Baruch go and give them the hardest mitzvah? Like, es Esav's essence was to kill, right? Like, this is what this was what's inbred in him. So why did Akadish Baruch go and say, oh, you know, I don't know what's written inside there? Do not kill. Like, the hardest thing, that's for Esav, that's what Akadish Baruch gave him. For Ishmael, do not steal. I'm like, this is literally what the, they're, they're, it's ingrained in them, that character trait. Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu go and give them the most difficult thing in the Torah for them? If you, want to, if you want to sell someone something, a good salesman doesn't first show you the negative, I shouldn't say the negative, the difficulties is a better word, of what they're trying to sell you. They, they will tell you the positive. Oh, you know what? If you have the Torah, you're going to have tremendous amount of brachas and blessing and siyata dishmaya. There'll be like so much awesome, amazing things. And then you'll be like, you know, like in the commercials for the drugs. And then the side effect is, brrr, and you know, you rub it, you know, rub it off, and like a potential, you know, like stomach cramps, headaches, you know, change of pers personality, you know, like, well, like crazy things, you know, like, and possibly death, you know, like, oh, please take Tylenol, you know, like, it, it, you you put it all the way at the end that you could almost not hear it. You get one of those auctioneers to go and, or me when I'm speaking fast, and just like, zoo, you know, zip through the entire, the entire side effects or the entire difficulties of that medication or of whatever it is that you're trying to sell. So why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu go and give them the most difficult thing possible for them? And the answer is, is that, now I'll tell you, even make this question even better. You know what? 
would have been nicer or uh, easier sell. Yishmal, because Yishmal should have went to Yishmal. Not should have, but obviously Yishmal did exactly what he's doing. But, but imagine this, this tactic. Yishmal go to Yishmal, be like, um, you know what's written in the Torah? Achnas is Archim. That's what Yishmal is good at. Like, like that's what they're, they were inbred with by, by Avar Bavinu. Like, they know Achnas is Archim. You go to any, you know, any Arabic country, they're very into welcoming and having guests. You know, so, so like, Akadish Baruch says, you want to attend Torah? Hachnas Asarichem. They're like, oh yeah, we can do that. Like, we excel at that. That's amazing. You know what it should, it should have said to Esav? Esav says, you know what, what's written in the Torah? Kabedis Avicha Vesimecha. You have to honor your parents. Esav's like, wait a minute, I got this. You know, like, I know how to do keep it up aim. You know, it's like, why did not only Akadish Baruch give the one that's easy for them, that they're more attracted to, that they're more ingrained, but rather the thing that's the most difficult? And the answer is, is that one of the purposes of Torah, of learning Torah, of, of gaining the Torah, of in, implanting the Torah, is to change you. It's to change who you are as a person. We have to become better people. You, the, the idea is, is that you take who you are, you implant the Torah inside of you, and through the Torah, you're able to change yourself to become a better person. To become a better spouse, to become a better father, to become a better child, to become a better friend, to become a better partner. You're able to become and change who you are into your, in, in the, in, in the roots, in the character traits of what you need to fix. You know, if you're dealing with a certain issue, a certain test in life, the goal isn't to shy away from that. Rather, it's to deal with it straight on. Asav had an issue. Killing. You got to work on it. How can this prophet say, you want to know what's in the Torah? It says you got to work on your issues. You're dealing with something. It's killing. That's what the Torah says. The Esau is like, no, 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 we're not interested. Ishmael says, you know, what's written in the Torah? It says exactly what you're dealing with, what your issue is, that's what's written in the Torah. You're dealing, your issue is what your issue is stealing. So hence, you know what's written in the Torah? You're not supposed to steal. You're not allowed to steal. You want to know why Akadosh Baruch Hu gave them the most difficult thing for them? Because that is the purpose. The purpose is to change who you are. Not to just do the easy things. Yes, granted, there is also easy aspects to it and enjoyable aspects that you can connect to without any tests. But the goal is to change who you are. But their response, the 70 nations, their response was, we're not interested. We don't want to change. So I could continue to offer the Torah to each and every single nation, one after another, and each one rejected it. Each one found something that had some sort of restriction on their lifestyle and they weren't interested in it. As for Abmatis Yehoshua Solomon. So wait a minute. So why did the Jewish people, the Yiddin, they accepted the Torah without, without asking any questions? They should have asked at least what's written inside. Didn't they know that there's going to be some restriction, something that's going to be difficult? Maybe we wouldn't be able to handle it. Maybe there will be certain things that we wouldn't be able to accomplish or maybe we'll fall short on. And maybe then it's not worth it. Maybe the other nations were right for asking. Why did the Jewish nation not ask what's inside? They said, Nah, seven Ishma. And the answer is, says Ramat Solomon, says that they knew that there's going to be difficulties. They knew that it's going to be restrictions. They knew that there's going to be cer certain restrictions on their lives. And it's going to be difficult. But they also knew that the Torah had the ability to transform who they are. The Torah would give them new strengths and would make the impossible possible. The Jewish people knew that the power of the Torah had the power to change even the most difficult ingr ingrated characteristic that's inside of you that you think that you would never be able to change. The Torah has the power to change it. So that's step number one. I'm going to try to go through three steps today, Bezat Hashem. Step number one, in order to make the Torah be able to change who you are, is you, you need to have a, a want and a willing to change. The Jewish nation had a willing and a want to change who they were, and they said in the Ishma, they realized the power of the Torah. The Gemara Kedushin, Daf Lamed on the base, goes and tells us that, that Kedush Baruch Hu goes and says, Barasi Sahara, I created the evil inclination. All your bad habits, Kedush Baruch Hu created that. The evil inclination is pushing those bad habits. It's planting those bad habits to go and full force. But Akadish Baruch goes and says, Brasi Tara Tavlin. I created an antidote for that evil inclination, and that's the Torah Kadesha. The Torah has the ability to go and overcome and override those bad characteristics. Those, the Torah has the power to change who you are at your core. We all have stuff we need to work on. And yes, sometimes therapy is needed. Sometimes therapy is required. 
But the bottom line is that everything is in the Torah. Yes, we need help, outside help, but the bottom, bottom line, everything is written in the Torah. There's, the, the, there's a midrash that gives a mushal. There was once a king, and the king wanted to um, build a palace. So he went from one city to another city and require, inquiring, like, you know, I want to build a palace in my city, like, you know, in the city, what's, uh, you know, can I, you know, are you guys up for it? And all the inhabitants of every city they went to, they ran away from him. They didn't want to, they, they basically were showing him, we don't want the palace in this city. Until finally, the king went to some desert ghost town and uh, the people there gracefully accepted the king and said, of course, we would love that you would have your palace built in our, in our city. The Medrash goes and explains that when Akadush Baruch Hu wanted to give the Torah, he went to the, he went to the ocean, he went to the sea, and his Tehillim, Daf Parak, excuse me, Kuf Yudalit, goes and says that what happened when the sea had this interaction, it says, Hayam Ra the, the sea ran away. And not only that, the Medrash goes and explains, even though this is referring to the, by, by Yamsov, but the Medrash goes and says that this is also reference to when the Kedush Baruch Hu was asking where to put, give the Torah. He went to the ocean, the ocean ran away. He went over to the mountains, Haharim Meraktu Ke'elim. The, the mountains danced like rams. The mountains also ran away. He then came to the desolate desert. He came to Har Sinai. And Har Sinai accepted him with open arms. And Kedush Baruch Hu gave the Torah, we're in the desert. This is the Medrash. What, what, is the med, what is the Medrash trying to go and teach us with this? Explains Rabbi Fran. He goes and he says that why didn't the nations, the other people in, in their cities, why didn't they want the king's palace built in their own uh, city? And the answer is that they, they had a certain lifestyle. They had certain customs that they were accustomed to, that they were used to. And they realized that all, if all of a sudden the king is coming to town, they're going to have to act differently. They can't do the things that they do, you know, on the side, you know, like they got extracurricular activity. They realize they have to be on top of and they weren't up for that. They were like, wait a minute, I don't want to change who I am. I have certain, you know, things that I got used to. I have certain things that I've gotten accustomed to and I can't just change so simple. So they, they just tried to run away. They didn't want the king to build a palace in their, in their city. But when the king came to the ghost town, the ghost town had nothing. They're like, yeah, no problem. You come over here, do whatever you got, remake us. Like, we have nothing anyway. Explains to Rabbi Fran, you know what, you, you know what happens when you want, you want to accept the Torah? You have to be like a desert. You have to be ready and open to change. You have to be ready and open and be like, yeah, yeah, come right in. Like, no problem. Do whatever. I'm ready to change for whatever it is that you need. For whatever it is that Kedush Baruch Hu needs, for whatever it is that the Torah needs, I am willing to change. That's so why you see sometimes people that look religious, but they don't act religious. They don't have the, the, you know, like, of what religious people are supposed to act like. So we know that everybody has things that they're dealing with, and we have to think, where do we hold? Are we like those cities, or are we like the desert? When we go and we accept Torah, do we accept it on our own terms? Be like, okay, you know, like a buffet. I'll take that. I'll take that. That's icky. I don't like that. I'm allergic to that. Shabbos, what's that? No, 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 no. Learning Torah, only that. Sneas, only on Shabbos when I see my rabbit's in. You know, like, and then we just, we pick like a buffet. Like, I'll take this, I'll take that, I'll take this. And then God, okay, I, I took from you. Now I have my shopping list. You know, you take a scroll written by the king's hand of the prince and be like, I want an amazing man, I want to get blah, blah, and a whole long list of all the things that you deserve. <laughs> After all, you know, like, uh, come on, I made a blessing last week that I really concentrated on. You remember that one? You know, like, you, we have all these things and we kind of pick and choose. So what are we doing? We're like those cities. Those cities where we're like, you know what? It's going to cramp our styles. So we pick and choose what we want. Or are you like that person? Uh, uh, are you the person that's taking, accepting the Torah like that desert? That says, yeah, yeah, just come right in and change whatever it is that you need to change. Whatever that is that I need to fix, I'm well, I'm, I'm open to fixing it. Sometimes you see Jews that maybe don't act so at their level. So those are the Jews that are not acting like the desert. Those are the Jews that are acting like the buffet, generally. Picking and choosing. You know, this idea, don't judge, judge the Jews by the Jew, which I hate, I don't like that. I don't like the, you know, the, you know that, uh, that saying. Because the truth of the matter is, is that if you have someone who's really, really from, like, like inside and outside, like they're amazing. 
yes, yeah, sometimes people are dealing with certain things and you know, everyone has tests in life. I'm not the one to judge them, uh, but everyone has certain tests in life and we all have difficulties. Just because they have a yarmulke and maybe it's this out, it doesn't mean that they don't have tests in life. And yeah, we shouldn't judge everybody by, by you know, what they are. Anyways, I digress. So, we said step one. Step one to change, have the Torah be able to change you, is that you have to have the will to change. And you have to realize the Torah has the ability to change you. Let's go to step number two. Step number two is we know that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is uh, judgment day, you know, it's judgment season. People are weird, you know, like that's a time where everyone's like super careful or they at least they should be. And uh, they know that this is the time they get judged. They get judged for what's going to be for the coming year and how much money they're going to make. Are they going to get married? Are they going to have children? All these amazing things. However, not everyone is a weir. And this is a uh, Rizal writes, the Shlach Kodesh writes, that there's a judgment on Shavuos as well. And the judgment on Shavuos affects each and every single one of us. The judgment on Shavuos is a judgment that determines the degree of success that each of us will have in pursuing our spiritual pursuits, our Torah studies, during the coming year. That is what we're getting judged on Shavuos. We know that on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, what we have to do, you know, we, we know how to prepare, you know, like if you want to make a lot of money that year, you make sure you're a good boy or a good girl, you know, between, the, you know, by the comes Rosh Hashanah, comes Sukkot, you want to get married, you got to make sure, you know, like, we know what we have to do, we have to do mitzvahs, we have to go and we have to pray, but the question is, for Shavuos, what's the preparation? What, what, what is it that we have to tap into? What is it that we have to do that, to, to get that year of success of learning and closeness and spirituality? So the Svarim condition. This is Rabbi Fran brings down. This Pharma Kedushim goes and says, hey, you want to know what the judgment is on? The judgment on Rosh Hashanah, uh, not on Rosh Hashanah, I'm sorry, on Shavuos, is on your desire, your cheshek, your desire to learn. The more that a person wants to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the more that he wa the person wants to go and learn Torah and get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the more success that that person will have in the coming year. So our avoda for the next, you know, short while until Shavuos is coming, depending on when you're listening to this, is that we have to increase our desire, our desire to get close to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, our desire to learn Torah, our desire to get that delve into that spiritually, tap into that holiness. Now there's different ways of demonstrating your desire, and Rabbi Friend brings down the story that there was a guy from, uh, uh, there's a guy, there's a mohel uh, from Manchester, from England. And uh, he one time went to, you, you, he used to go to Ukraine to do, you know, bris milah, to do circumcisions for the Jewish Russian babies that didn't have, they didn't have a mole over there, so he used to travel over there. Um, this is prior to the situation, obviously. Um, and he, um, there, was a, there was a rabbi in, from Muncie that met him and says, you know, can you, like, what was like the most memorial ex experience that you had, you know, in Ukraine? Like, can you share with me like a crazy story? So he goes and he says, you know, one time he went to this like off beaten track town with like dung, you know, like like in like old Ukraine where there's like barely any Jews. And uh, the, it used to be like years ago, it used to be a very vibrant town, but now there's, you know, everybody left. There's, there's very few Jews left over there. And he had to do a bris milah. So uh, they said that the bris milah is going to be in the shul. That he goes over to the shul, he walks in, and he sees that there are a number of people that are, you know, gathering in the shul. And he goes over to them and he says, "What time are we davening over here? What time are we praying over here?" So they were like, "Praying? No, no." He's like, uh, we, "We don't pray." And you're like, you're, "He's like the mall is like what, what, what?" He's like, "What do you mean you don't pray?" He's like, "No, yeah, we don't, we don't pray. We, you know, we're in shul, but we don't pray." So he's like, "Why don't you pray?" And they, were, they respond to him, it's like, you know, it's very simple, it's just, uh, we don't know how to. We have no idea how to pray. Like, you know, like, we don't know which way to hold the sitter. You know, like, is it sideways, like Chinese, is it upside down? Like, we have no idea how to, re like, we can't even begin to. And he's like, so the mall's like, so what are you doing in shul? Like, what, what you doing here? Like, what, what are you coming? And they, they looked at him and they were like, what do you mean, what are we doing over here? He's like, you know, you're, a Jew is supposed to come to shul. He's like, they saw it as two separate things. He says, a Jew needs to come to shul. A Jew also needs to pray. He says, we don't know how to pray, but we still know we have to come to shul. So we come to shul, 
but we don't pray because we don't know how to. I don't know. They schmooze over there. Whatever it is that they do, you know, over there. But that look at the desire that they had over there. Like, they didn't know what they needed to do. They didn't know how to do it, but they know they needed to do something. And I can't tell you, like, over the years and how many times, especially in, in the real live classes, you know, I know this is live, but like in-person classes, where I had guys that used to come and had no idea about, like, anything. And they would sit there and they would listen and they had no idea. They just knew they had to be there. They had to knew they had to learn. They didn't understand most of it. Over the time, they, they ended up, you know, growing and becoming, you know, like crazy religious because of that desire. But they knew that they had to do something. So they just came, even though they had zero background, zero understanding, but they knew they had to go to shul. There is a cheshik, there is a desire realizing that somebody knows that they need to do something. They don't know how to do it, but at least they do whatever it is that they could have. And this, the, the, the Jewish people of Ukraine in this town, they showed their desire that they wanted to get close to Israel, we just don't know how. So they came to the part that they didn't know how. You know, speaking about davening, you want to know how you have an understanding of, of what's important in your life, is what do you pray for? So you pray for a shidduch, you pray for your children, you pray for parinasa, you pray for health, and, and that's great, we, you know, we should pray for these things. But how many people pray for the spiritual growth? How many people pray that they are able to understand the Torah? How many people pray that they have the desire to grow closer to Akadosh Baruch How many people pray that they should be able to pray better? You know, think about that for a second. How many times do you pray that the thing that you just did, you should be able to do better? Like you're doing it already, but you're asking Akadosh Baruch please let me do it better. Let me connect you more. Like, we have to show what we... What is important to us? You know, we have a will to change. But there is something else that comes after that will. And that needs to be a desire. Because if you have the will to change, that's nice. But it's going to stay as a will. You have to change, you have to turn that will into a desire. And the Chazanish Hashi goes and brings down. He says, you know, We go and we should pray for divine aid and you know, spiritual aid in, in, in learning. I have a rabbah in the morning, I have a salam in the evening, you know, for, for the men that, you know, they uh, pray alvit. This is, we're praying for, for getting an understanding of the Torah. We have to go, we have to have that, we have to pray for that, we have to show the importance of that, to, to talk to this bracha for the Torah. So step one, we said you have to have the will. The will to go to cha and change. Step two is the desire. You have to have the desire to go and change because a will alone is not going to take you to the, to, to the finish line. You need to have the desire. Everybody has a will of losing weight, of making a million dollars. Everybody has that will. Having great children, that's great. You have that will. Most people do. The desire is what people are lacking because the desire is what's going to push you to go forward. The question is, how do you get that desire? The Gemara in Adarim goes and says that the destruction of the land of Eretz Yisrael was that the Jewish people did not recite the blessing before learning Torah. Now we have to understand this, like why is that, like, like what's going on over here? So the Ron goes and says that they did, the Jewish people did not consider Torah prestigious enough, chashev enough, worthy of the bracha. So, so if you're learning chemistry, math, science, any other secular study, you don't make a blessing for it. When you make a blessing for something is where you appreciate the importance of it. You demonstrate the value of what it has. When the people during the destruction of the land of Israel, they didn't make the blessing on learning Torah that shows that they didn't appreciate the value of what the Torah has. If you don't appreciate the value of what Torah has, you lose a lot of the power that it contains inside of it. Now let me share with you uh, the way that the Ishbitzer Rebbe goes and explains this. He goes and he, and he quotes Haggai Sashri that in, in Mesech Tes Bav Metziah that uh, gives a case. And the case is like this, a Allah case. That let's say Reuven goes and buys a piece of metal. And he thought this piece of metal was uh, lead. And Reuven paid the price of lead for the, you know, the current going later, right? And he purchased this piece of metal. He then later takes this metal and uh, still assuming that it's lead, he sells it to Shimon for the price of lead. Later, Shimon discovers that this piece of metal is not lead, but it's in fact silver, worth a lot of times more than what lead is worth. And now Reuven hears about it and Reuven's like, wait a minute, I sold you this silver 
it's really silver. You have to pay me the difference. You have to pay me back. You know, you paid only for lead. Now it's silver. You have, we found out. Now you have to go and pay him back. So they brought this, the, you know, into uh, you know, to the, into the rabbinical court. And the guy says three rules that Shimon can keep the metal. Shimon was a second guy. He bought from Reuben. He can keep the metal. And he doesn't need to pay any payments extra to Ruvain for selling him that, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the silver or the lead that was really, uh, really silver. Why? What's the reason? The reason is that since Ruvain never realized what he had, he bought it as lead, he sold it as lead, he never realized what he had, so in that case he never owned the silver. If he never, he never owned the silver, there's no payment that needs to be made. The Spitzer Rebbe goes and says that this is the meaning, this is the way that we could explain that during the time of the destruction of the land of Israel, it says that they abandoned the Torah. What did they mean they abandoned the Torah? They didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they weren't, ma they didn't realize its importance. They didn't realize its chashivas. The, the, the idea of making a blessing shows that it's important. And they didn't appreciate that. And what happens is if you don't appreciate what you have, it's as if you don't have it. It's just like Ruvain. He didn't, uh, he didn't realize that he had silver. It's as if he didn't have it. You want to appreciate the power of Torah, you have to realize what, is, what it contains. You want the blessings for it, you have to appreciate the value of what it is. And this is one of the tasks we have to work coming on to Shavuos, is that we have to make sure we don't take the Torah for granted. We have to realize the power of the Torah. The power of Torah has the power to change everything of who you are. On Shavuos, we read on uh, you know, the story of Rus, Rus and Op, Arpa, and you think about it, these are two sisters, that they were the daughters of the king. Aglan, the king, he was a king, and they lost their husbands, and now they had a choice of going with their widowed, elderly mother-in-law, back to like with zero possessions, or to go and to go back to the king's palace. And if you think about it, who made the logical decision really was Arpa. She went back home. She went back to the... That's a logical decision. Why is Rus going? And Rav Leib Chasman goes and explains this. You know what, how Rus, Rus saw this? Rus saw this as a difference between life with Torah and life without Torah. If you look at it from there, then it was an easy decision. Yes, she was going to give up everything. But life without Torah is not worth living. Rus had the idea, she knew the value of what a Torah life was. And she was willing to give up all the materialistic pleasures that she had going for her. She, didn't ha she was just going to go home, her father had everything. She was willing to give everything up because she realized the power of what the Torah HaKadosh has. This is what we read on Shavuos. This is the essence of Shavuos. So the question, Let's look at the, let me tell you the story. I was going to skip it. I have to tell you, running short time. Let me tell you really quickly, super quick. So uh, there was a, an, an Amira and the, I, uh, you know, the Amira's name is Rabbi Kahana. And he had a son that he had to this son. He wanted to go and have him to go and learn Torah. So the son was five years old and he brought him to the tutor. And he says, if you learn with my son for 25 years, I will give you a thousand gold coins. So the tutor says, fine, not a problem. He goes and he teaches the son for, uh, for, for the period of uh, 25 years. Now this, the, he graduates the thing, he, the father pays him a thousand gold coins, and now the son was literally learning for 25 years straight. Like he was completely oblivious of what was going on in the outside world. Finally, he, um, he goes and he decides he's gonna visit the marketplace. He's 30 years old, he goes and visits the marketplace. He's going around, he's looking around, and he sees, you know, there's somebody, you know, selling some water, and he's very thirsty, so he says, can I get a glass of water? And he's like, sure, a dollar. And he's like, I don't got any money. He's like, what do you mean you don't got any money? He says, yeah, I, for the past 25 years, I've just been sitting and learning Torah. And the guy's like, well, you can't pay with Torah. You gotta pay with money. You gotta pay with dollars over here. So the guy was going about, but, but like, I'm a, I, I learned for 25 years. And he says, but learning doesn't pay the bills. You gotta go and you gotta pay the money. And he, he wouldn't give him the glass of water because he didn't have any money. So. Rav Kahana's son, his name was Salik, he was so upset. He's like, wait a minute, it's like I just spent 25 years for what? I didn't get anything out of it? Like I, I can't even go and get a glass of water? He comes home, he's very upset. He's very, very upset. And he says, this is what I, I should go and get. Why did you teach me this as his father? I should go to the, and, and learn the, a job, learn to be able to survive. So the father goes and says, he says, I'm going to make you a deal. He says, I have a diamond upstairs. 
I want you to go and take this diamond and sell it. Half of that money you'll take to open up your own business if you want to continue in that life. The other half will use for me for, um, you know, for, you know, during my old age. So the, um, the son said, fine. He says, not a problem. You know, let's do that. He takes a diamond and the father goes and instructs him to listen. He says, first, you're going to go to this place. You know, and he gives him like the glass shop, the glass warehouse, you know, the glass district. And then he says, you're going to go to the pawn shop district. And then you're going to go to the low level diamond district. And then you go to the specialist. And it says, you're not going to sell it until you get all the prices. He says, you're going to go get it appraised in all different, all these different shops. And he said, fine. And he goes from the lowest level to the glass specialist. And they, they're looking at the diamond. They're like, you know, for this diamond, it looks beautiful. I'll give you $7,500. He goes and he get, gets around the same in the, in the glass district. He goes to the pawn shop where everybody going and selling their, their used items. And the pawn shop is looking over there. The, the specialist says, you know, this is a very nice diamond. I'll give you 25 grand for it. And he says, wow, that's amazing. He goes into the low level diamond specialist and they look at the diamond. They're like, wow, this diamond He says, we'll give you a hundred grand. And he went from store to store there. He got up to 250 grand for this diamond. Again, remember he was in the glass. They wanted to pay him $7,500 for it. Now he's getting a quarter of a million dollars. Then he goes to the specialist, the top specialist, you know, in the area. And the specialists over there are, you know, very hard. He gets an appointment by them and finally gets in. And this guy is giving him a quote of a million dollars. This guy's giving him 2.5. His highest quote he gets for that diamond is $5 million. He goes back to his father and says, you know, his dad, what's going on over here? He's like, he's like, one guy is seven and a half thousand dollars. The other guy is five. We're like, how could it be such a drastic difference? The father, Rav Kahana, goes and says, he says, you know, when you go and you show someone who's, it's not a specialty, he doesn't know the value of it. He says, the guy in the glass district has no idea the value of this diamond. The guy in the pawn shop, he doesn't know the value. Even this diamond specialist, the, only the top of the top can really uh, assess the beauty of this diamond. He says, you're going to a water peddler. And you're wanted to get some, some, you know, something for your Torah. He says, what does he know about the value of Torah? You know, like, <coughs> it doesn't pay his bills. He says, you want to go, you want to know what the, spe you want to know what the Torah is worth? Go to the specials. Go to the, go to the Bet HaMidrashot. Go to the, go to Bet HaMidrashot. Go to the place where people are sitting and learning. They're going to be able to appreciate of what you have. He says, you know, we have to think about it. Like, how do we view Torah? Do we view the Torah as the water carrier, the water special, the water salesman? Be like, yeah, okay, fine. So you're not paying the bills. Or do we view the water or do we view Torah as the diamond specials, realizing that every word is worth five million dollars? Where do we put our, our importance? Where do we realize and, and, and understand the value of the Torah? Let me give you a quick recap and then we'll finish with one final thought. So we know that we have in order to go and have the Torah change you. You have to have the will to change. But that's not enough to have the will to change. That was step one. Step two is that you have to turn that will into a desire. You want to accomplish great things, that's great. But if you don't have that burning desire, it will only take you so far. The question is that how do you get that desire? To get that desire, you have to realize the value. When you realize the value, all of a sudden the desire comes in. When you realize the value of the diamond, you're going to guard it so much greater. When you realize the value of the Torah, when you realize the importance of the Torah, you have a, so much of a stronger affinity, so much of a stronger uh, a, a reason to go and internalize it and accomplish it and, and be able to grasp it. So you have step one, the will. You have step two, the desire. This leads you to step three, and that's the action. That's the na'asev and ishma. This is the thing that we started off with saying that the Jewish people said na'asev and ishma. Every time that you learn, every time that you listen to a class, you should have a takeaway from it. What am I going to act differently? How am I going to internalize the Torah? How am I going to get more dveikas to HaKadosh Baruch How am I going to get more connected to HaKadosh Baruch We know that in, in, in the, the Jewish life, there's two very important aspects of living a Torah life. Number one is learning Torah. That's Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, talking to you. And number two is davening. That's you talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. This is like a relationship. The Rambam in Hilchas Shuva goes, and when he discusses Ahavas Hashem, love of Hashem, he goes and he compares it to a love between a man and a woman. Just like it says in Shir Hashem, in Parak Beis, in Shir Hashem, it says, Ki ani. I'm sickly in love with you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I'm sick in love with you. 
And if we realize whenever we're talking about Torah, it's always about love. In Shachas, we pray right before, right before Kriyashma, we say, Ahava Rabbah, we're speaking about what? Chemla Gedayla, give please Hashem, show me your love. And we ask for love and compassion when we understand the Torah. And the question is that why do we need, in order to understand the Torah, why do we need love? Why do we need compassion? Why do we need all this grace? Why can't we just go and learn it? Why do we need this love in order to connect? Because if you want to tap into the holiness of the Torah, you need that desire. The desire is kichaylas avani. I'm so in love with you. What greater desire is it that, that when you love someone and you want to do whatever it is that you can for that person? When you love someone, that's when it becomes part of who you are. That's when your will turns into your desire and your desire turns into action. And then when you have that action, you're able to say na'asev and ishma. This is the level of relationship of na'asev and ishma that the Jewish people reached on Har Sinai. They were so connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They were like a desert. We're willing to accept anything. We're willing to change whatever it is we need to change. It doesn't, we're here, we're open. Why? Because when you love HaKadosh Baruch Hu so much, it doesn't matter what it says inside. Na'asev and ishma will do it. They had the will to change. They had the desire to change. And then they were able to implement that Na'asev and Ishma. So coming this Shavuos, we have to go and we have to internalize these aspects. We have to realize, first of all, we have to really gain that desire. That desire is what we're getting judged on. The desire to go and learn and connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But we have to start off with the will. We have to have the will to change who we are to become a better person. You're sitting and you're learning, you're becoming better. You can't come out of Torah class angry, upset, stingy, lazy. You gotta go and rejuvenate it. You gain something. You're taking out of something out of the class. And then you're taking that will and you're turning that will into the desire. And once you have the desire, then you have the Nasev Ishma. Then we're going to be able to accept the Torah. And then it could change us who we are. We can become the best version of ourselves of who we can be.